um, I'll do like a real quick introduction and everything, and then you can just start with what you're doing. Okay. All righty. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We have Patricia Pike here from Onslow County, who is going to go over GIS and some other, you know, fantastic stuff that they've got going on over at the county. We were really hoping to have our first in-person class in months and months and months, but it's still not quite working out for us. So we really do appreciate everybody that could make it onto this Zoom recording. And then please do know and share with your friends that this is being recorded. So if there are items that you want to go back to, to refresh your information on, or if you missed something, or um, if it didn't really apply to you, and then all of a sudden it does, it will be recorded and JBOR will have that up and in a searchable format for you so you can find it. And please do let um, other people in your office or any other agents or anybody that you know know about this as well. Every time Patricia does a class for us, we learn so, so much. Um, so I know there's going to be stuff, um, especially now that those, those flood maps have changed. I'm assuming there's going to be some issues with that. And hopefully Patricia can maybe clear stuff up. If you do have questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves and, um, and ask away, or you can put them in the chat box and I will try to monitor that. So Patricia does not have to keep looking at the chat section, but please do um, ask away any questions that you have. And then we'll have time at the end as well. If it's something that you think can wait, but if it's something on a screen that we're on, please don't hesitate to interact. We really want this to be a good interactive class. So with that all being said, if nobody has any questions right now, we are going to go ahead and let Patricia get started. Thank you once again, Patricia, for doing this for us. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with y'all. Um, so sorry that we couldn't do it in person. So um, this is a little challenging doing it uh, virtually for me because I'm accustomed to doing them, you know, in person. So if I go too fast or I lose you, please unmute yourself and let me know and I'll be glad to go back over it. So um, first of all, I just want you to know that um, over the weekend, our vendor moved everything to a new server. So sometimes when that happens, if you're having some difficulty getting some things to work, you may have to clear your cache on your browser that you're using. So um, make sure that you have cleared your cache recently if you're having any problems. Um, if sometimes things go a little crazy, you want to clear your cache. And I am using IE is what I'm working, Internet Explorer is the browser I'm showing but it should work in any browser. And if you have problems with your particular browser, um, you can call us and we can try to walk you through it. You know, if you're having some kind of issues or maybe if you don't know how to clear your cache, then we can show you, you know, talk you through how to do that. So um, to get started, what I normally start with is letting you know that there are several different ways that you can search. So, um, this search active layer that is up at the top, you could search there. And this search is based on this is your active layer. So anything that you're searching, if I change my active layer to zoning and I try to put a person's name in this search, it's not going to work. It has, just remember this search active layer, this is your active layer. Um, you could do a search by hitting search here and you've got your same searching mechanisms here, but you can do an advanced search by going here, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit later. And you can search by address, by entering an address here. And then if you're really good with like SQL statements, you could actually do an advanced um, query builder, but you would just have to make sure you got all your syntax and things right for that. But generally what I tell people to use is the binoculars over on the left side, because with that, you can search several different ways. So you can use your parcel owner to search. I can change it. If you've got that tax ID number, you can use that. 
If you've got our map number, you can use that. Or if you've got a property address, you can use that. So for example, on this, if I put in um, a property address of 140 Banks Bridge, and I always tell people less is better. So don't always add in like the road, the drive, the highway, because what you think it may be or what might have got typed into the tax system and what it actually is could be two different things, but generally the, the street name is going to be correct. So if I do 140 Banks Bridge Road, <clears throat> it's going to zoom me right to that property. Whereas if I put 140 Banks Bridge up in this part, and notice down here I have one result, and I say go, then it's going to give me four results. And the reason why is when you're searching this active layer, it's going to search anything that has that address. So if you have multiple properties, then it's searching based off of that mailing address. Because if you come over and you look at the mailing address, it's going to give you all of those four properties are owned by the same person. So those four properties are going to show up that way. And when you were looking, then the property you were looking for actually um, may not have come up because it's according to how it's listed. Whereas if you're searching by the binoculars, it's going to the physical address of the property. That way you would get your one property. So, and then you would just zoom to it. It may still be in there. It's just according, you might not have the, it might be owned by somebody differently or that person may um, not own the property, which is normally doesn't work that way, but they may not own the property that you're particularly looking for and somebody else may own it. And so if you searched here, it'll go straight to the one property that you're looking for and you don't have to be concerned with other properties that show up. So if you get to this, to the property that you're looking, um, the information below is giving you different links that you can go to, as well as tax information about it. So as you scroll across, you're getting the physical address, you're getting the legal description, the deed book and page, the date the property was acquired, if there um, was a subdivision that went along with it, it would tell you what that subdivision is. It gives you the values, and if you scroll up to the top, you can see what those different columns mean, which is another reason why if you searched here and you only had one, it would be at the top and you wouldn't have to keep scrolling up and down. But you can move this bar and stretch it out. So if you needed to be able to see more about it, you could do that. Um, but you can come across, it gives you your final um, just the land value, the building value, the tax market value, the taxable value. And these can be different. Like if you notice on this property, they're different. The market value is basically what the market is showing for that particular property. The taxable value is it could be in the farm um, use, which is called present use value. And so if you're being used for farming, then there, you're paying a lower tax rate or tax value on it than what the market is. But also to go along with that is you're deferring taxes as well. So if on this particular property, if I was to sell that to a, an individual, then that back taxes the difference between this value and this value for the past five years is going to become due when that property is sold. So that's something to be aware of as you're selling properties. You want to make sure they're, because that's really considered a back tax um, if it got sold. If I transferred this to my children, then it can be transferred without it having to come out of that present use value. Um, but there also could be like an age exemption so the person may be getting um, some type of a tax relief because of age, or they might have a veteran's exemption. So
so that would only that would be your reason why your taxable value would be different than your market value. Um, this neighborhood code, this is a way of, um, we're going to do a search. Um, this is the way that the tax office, when they're appraising property, they put like property together in a neighborhood. So sometimes it could be a subdivision. Sometimes it could be just one section of a subdivision. Um, sometimes it could be a couple of subdivisions together that they are considering a neighborhood that the valuing on it is similar. Your property types, this V stands for vacant, D stands for dwelling, O stands for other, and other is something other than a main structure on the property. So in other words, it could have um, a concrete on it. It could have, um, a shed or a tobacco barn or something other than a main structure, a residential or commercial structure on it. If it does have a structure on it and it's a dwelling, it's going to be residential. So you're going to get your year built, the heated square footage, the acreage that's being charged on the property. Um, this city would tell you if it was, if it was like in the city of Jacksonville, it's going to say Jacksonville under the city park. The town is the township it's in. And then you've got your physical city, which is goes along with the mailing address. I mean, with the physical location of the property. Then your mailing address, this is how you would be able to tell if this was the, you know, Austin, Texas, then that's a way sometimes to be able to tell that if it's a rental property or not. If this was, if the, property type had a C here, it would mean it's a commercial property. So if it had a commercial structure on it, you would come on across here to where these COM things are, which stand for commercial, and it would give you more information about that, con that commercial property. So your area, your square footage of the building would be under COM area, and then you've got your commercial value which is your building value for that commercial property. Because our commercial and residential are in like two different tables um, because of course they are um, appraised differently. So they're in different like databases. So that gives you the information about that property um, as you're going all the way across. So as I come across to this side, there are several things that you can do. Um, I can create a report. So I'm going to bring this back down. So if I wanted to see um, a nice, neat packaged report um, to give to a client, I can click on Create Report, and a window's going to pop up. And you'll see a, a report that's set up for it. It's basically what we call a CAN report. So it gives you the, that tax parcel ID and our map number. It gives you the owner's name and their mailing address. Whatever layers you have turned on on your map are going to show up in your report. So as I'm scrolling down, then you get the rest of the information about that property. So the acres, the physical address, that neighborhood code we talked about, if it had a plat book and page, a subdivision recorded with it, it would show there. It gives you your values, all the information that you saw as you scrolled across, but it puts it in a nice, neat format. And as you're scrolling down, it's going to give you the last deed date, um, the most current date that we have on record with it. And if it had a sale price on that, it would give you that. Again, if I go back, and let's say I want to look at the aerials that go along with this property. I would go up here to map layers, scroll down to the bottom, and this is the different years of aerials that you can turn on. So our 2018 is our, our newest aerials that we have. So if I turn on my aerial and now I do create report, then the aerial should show as well. So that's a way so like I said, any air layers that you have turned on on your map are going to show up on that CAN report. 
So then the other links that are here, if you wanted to know more about that property as far as the tax records go, you can click view your property record card and it takes you to the tax website and you can click on each one of these and get different information about it. More information about your, just the structure of the building itself. Um, the OB wise, that these are things, if there were not a main structure on it and it had just an O, it's because it's got outbuildings or other buildings on it. So it could have concrete or blacktop and not have an actual dwelling on it and, and it would show in the OBY details. If there were permits that we had keyed into the tax system, it would show you that information here. It gives you information, you know, just about the land, a sketch of the building itself, and your full legal. And then if there's a photo um, on our, um, in the tax office for that, it's going to show that. And like this says one of two. So there was a picture taken in 2009. And then there's a picture taken, an older picture um, taken. I'm not sure what the date is of that one, but um, it says 4-23-2008. So there's two different um, pictures of, of our home. So then the other thing that I usually tell people to do though if you wanted to print that property record card to have a card that looks like if you came to the tax office, you would want to go here to property record card and then say go. And you can open up the card and this gives you more of a printable format with all the information about the property and it'll put the house on, you know, if there's a picture of the house. It'll only put the most current one on there, but you get your sketch and everything like it's very similar to a property record card that you would get from our office or from the tax office. So then um, I call it our Bible of information. So if you wanted to know more information about why we're charging the property with the 0.55 acres, you can go here to view GIS seed cards. And this actually takes you to my staff's records of information that we have. And so it, you'll get a, um, we are trying to put everything into a digital format. What we did is we scanned all of these cards originally. So sometimes when you see a nice handwritten or typed out card, it may have left off some information from the previous one. So if you click on this one, this is actually our file card and this was a digital file that we made from that file card. So if you come to this file card where it was handwritten, you can see um, the previous owners and it gives you previous deed references. And all of these go back, um, these cards were actually created in the 70s. So any information that has been obtained on this property since the 70s is gonna show on this card. And then as you scroll down, um, you'll see the different deeds that go along with this property. And you'll see any other documents that we have with it. This is like how we plot out the um, information from that particular um, property. So it gives you like the meets and bounds description. This would be a plot of that meets and bounds description. So if on this card, if there had been any splits or additions or anything like that, you would see it over in this area and it would say split to and or if it was combined with something, it would give you that and you'd see the acreage changing. And according to how much information has changed on this, you may have a card here and according to how old the card is, there you might find information in the middle of the card that also has to do with splits. Then the view deeds is going to take you to the register deed site. And of course, it's going to give you this information about our browser. If you do it the first time, acknowledge it, then you won't get that anymore. And then it's going to link to the most current deed. So of course, you can come here and click on that deed. And then you'll get all of the pages of the deed um, where we normally just keep 
um, the page that gives the grantor and the grantee's name and the legal description on it. We don't normally keep the signature page in our, um, in our records for that. Same thing if there was a plat to go with this. Of course, this one says no subdiv, so there's not a subdivision plat that goes with it. But if it had one and you had a plat booking page, you could click that and it would take you to that plat as well. So talking about our different layers that we have in our um, application, as you, again, the way I got this is I just went to map layers and you'll see the list of the layers. So like for on, on this lot, if you turned on the acreage, it's gonna give you, um, if there was dimensions done, which is just plain text basically that's thrown on a page. Um, if there's dimensions for that property, then you'll get the dimensions of the property. Um, and that's, like I said, it's text that has been typed in by my staff. And that's what all of this annotation is. So anything that was added as far as text goes, you'll be able to turn those on and you'll be able to see all of that. It will make it draw slower if you refresh and move around on your map. So I always tell people not to leave those on as you're um, moving around, except for your road names you would want to leave those on, makes it easier to see. Then you have uh, stream names. There's just a bunch of different layers of annotation you can turn on. But when you get down to the map itself, um, like this address point, if you're wondering what the icons are, when you go here, it'll tell you. So that represents, that icon represents a house. We have modulars, double wides, single wides, campers, um, duplexes, triple wides, hog farms, all kinds of things that are added on um, that the icons are. But just a little single um, green circle. Sometimes people call and they'll, they need an address and we can assign an address and they might say, I need it for refinancing my property and the bank said I had to have an address. So we just put a non-addressable structure on that but it could be um, uh, maybe you've got a, a barn in the backyard that um, you have water to. The water department on WASA will not let them have water connection to anything unless they have an address to go along with it. So sometimes we would call that a non-addressable structure. So that would be the reason you would see a little green dot there. Our polling sites, that's the, your voter um, locations. We've got major roads and center lines. They both are basically the same. It's just the major roads like um, your North Carolina highways, your US highways, that is what is included in major roads. Our streams layer, if you turn on the streams, then you should be able to see any stream with the name of that stream. Um, and that's a separate layer that we have. Um, our PAR line layer, that is a layer that will show you sometimes um, if we have easements, but we don't always map easements, so you can't 100% depend on, if you don't see an easement on a property, don't feel like that that means there's not one. There could very easily be one. We just did not map it because it doesn't affect us as far as values go, but as like this says ingress, egress easement, and you can see right here on this property, they did have a, um, a map out or deeded easement, and we've pulled it either off of a, a recorded plat or off of a deed and plotted it in to be able to see those easements. The other thing that you'll see a lot of is um, old lot lines. So where it says like old lot line. So like if these two properties were consolidated and you wanted to see where the old lot line was at, we normally put those in when we, if we have to move a line or we're consolidating properties. So you can see the way the property was mapped at a previous time. I'm trying to see if I saw one on here. So like over on this property, you can see at one time, this was the property line for this particular property. 
but they added more property to it. So there's your old lot line, and now this has been consolidated. And then this red dash line, there's an easement going all the way back that is recorded back to this property. And at one time, this, this property has probably been consolidated, and at one time it was a property by itself, and there was your old lot line. So that's called par line. Then you've got your census blocks. At one time, North Topful Beach was doing some dune pushing and they asked us to add this layer for them. Of course, you got your parcels. Um, during the election time, there was um, a lot of issues about um, North Carolina House districts because of um, the district line change. So we were asked to put that on as a layer. So we added it. Then you've got your election um, voter election district. And then your fire ISO, that's a pretty important layer that we get a lot of questions about. So this tells you what that layer is. And if I wanted to know what my fire ISO rating is, I can change this map from parcels to fire ISO, hit my identify tool, which is the little eye with the circle around it, and click on the property that I'm interested in. And it's going to come up below that and it's going to tell you what that rating is. So for the Northwest Onslow Fire District, which is also known as the Richland Fire District, the ISO rating is a five. The lower the number, the better your insurance rating is. So that's when people are buying property, we're, we get a lot of calls about what is the ISO rating and how far they are from hydrant. Um, we have a hydrant layer, but it is protected by Homeland Security, so that's why it's not on our website. So in our office, we can do measurements um, from, the, from the structure out to where that nearest hydrant is. <clears throat> Then you've got your township, your zip codes. We have a wetlands layer here. Don't bank on this. This is an extremely old, old, old layer that um, I've probably had since the 90s. Um, it is something that could be used, but we have added another layer. If you scroll down, and of course it's not on right now, but we had another layer we added for, um, that was a more accurate layer, a more up-to-date layer, but we're pulling it from another um, website. The, actually, we're pulling it from the um, National Wetlands Inventory, and sometimes their site goes off, and when it goes off, it, it messes up our site, so we have to take it off when we can't get their site to connect. So that's why you don't see it right now. Otherwise, it would be right there. So right now, that wetlands is the um, best that we have to be able to show you. Um, but like I said, I wouldn't bank on that. This is a really old layer. And basically, if you see some color, then in this layer, which was many years ago, for, came from the Department of um, environment and natural resources. So that's why it says NCDENR approximation um, because it is a really old, old layer, but there could be, it, it may not be wetlands now because the rules for wetlands have changed through the years. So this might wouldn't be considered a wetland area, but back when we got this layer, it was considered that. Um, then flood zones. We have, as, as I'm sure you know, our flood zones have changed a lot um, recently. As 619-2020 is when the flood zone layers um, changed. So we changed the maps um, based on those um, flood zones. So now if you wanted to know what the effective flood zone your property is in now, you would want to look at flood effective. So if I turn on this flood effective, and I'm going to go to an area that I know has some flooding. And you can see there's an X here. That X is basically means that it's not in an area um, that is 
regulated for flood zones. And I always want to see as much real estate on my map as I can. This overall map that's on the bottom right hand corner, to get rid of that, you see the little arrow in the corner, you can close that up. That way you have more real estate area to be able to look at for your map. Um, with your flood zone, same thing. With your map layers, you can move that over or you can just close it and it'll, it'll disappear off your screen. So for this area, um, you can see that this is the current flood map. And if, you, if this was the property that you were interested in and you were looking at this part of it, you could see that the blue area is an AE zone. The yellow area is what many years ago was called a B zone, but it's um, basically a 500 year flood zone, which is now called a 0.2% um, annual chance of flood hazard. And then this hatching in the middle, it is an AE zone, but that is your flood way. So you can't build in that area at all. You cannot build. So if you were trying to buy this property, you wouldn't be able to build on it because there's, it's, it's in the floodway and you cannot build in the floodway. Um, but if you wanted to know more about that property you, or that flood part of it, you would change your um, active layer to flood effective, click your identify, and so if I click right on this particular piece of property, it tells you that it's in the floodway. It tells you it's an AE zone. It's not giving you a base flood elevation because you can't build in that area. So, but maybe I was interested in this property. So if you click the identify on it, it tells you it's an, in an AE zone, but it's not giving you a BFE, this base flood elevation, because they didn't do, um, um, in-depth study of this area to get that base flood elevation. Um, and then if I click in the yellow area, then it tells you that it's that 0.2%, but it also gives you this panel number to go along with it. So if you needed to pull the actual flood panel, and sometimes some of the reports ask you what panel number it's on, then it will give you that panel number. This effective date, I don't know why, I just got a call about it this morning um, that this effective date has gone squirrely for some reason, but I gotta fix that. But it did have the actual effective date of the area that you're looking at on there. And that's very important because some of the areas actually got updated June 19th of 2020, and some of the areas in the county did not. For example, if you were in um, North Topsail Beach looking at property, and you're right on the edge of North Topsail Beach and Surf City. Surf City's areas were not adopted June 19th of 2020 because the majority of Surf City is in Pender County. And Pender County's maps, their new maps have not been adopted yet. So anything that touches basically a, a panel that is partially in Surf City, they would have taken the whole panel. So there's an area in North Topsail Beach that it did not take in the, there's part of North Topsail Beach that you, the effective is still the old maps like the um, 2005 effective date where the properties next door to it are, have been changed based off of the 6-19-2020 date. So I need to get this date back in here. I'm, I'm not sure if it's something that our vendor changed when he updated um, to a new server, but that is supposed to be the date and it would be like 6, 19, 2020, or uh, I think it was 11, two, uh, 2005, but whatever the date was on it, it would tell you. The city of Jacksonville are um, contesting um, or challenging the flood maps, the new flood maps, the 619 flood maps. So anything that touches their area, so any panel that touches the city of Jacksonville, they had to leave out the entire panel. So none of their maps have been adopted as well. So if that's the case, then what you would want to do is instead of looking at the effective, 
you would want to look at the preliminary and you'd want to change that map layer over to preliminary. Instead of looking at the effective, you'd want to turn on the um, preliminary portion of it and to be able to see that map to see, you know, what the differences would be with it. So now if I identify um, this area, then it's going to come up and give me information about this. So this panel, um, I don't know why it's not giving me a date. I really think November 3rd, of, it could be November 3rd or not, 7. The date, it should have the date on there. I need to fix that. And it should have the pre-date of that. So if there was a, a map that had got changed prior to that, it's going to give you that date and it's going to give you the effective date. But I got to go back and fix those dates or, or get the contractor to check his dates on there. I don't know if they've changed it over to a, a numeric field instead of a date field and that's what's happened to it, but we got to fix it because you, you definitely need those dates on there. Um, but if you, let me go down to North Hopsville Beach and look at, at that property. I think of an address is in Topsville. I guess that wasn't a good address. So if it's a, a map that is effective, if you turn on the preliminary layer, which we've got the preliminary layer turned on, then it's going to give you the effective date of that. So that map, this particular tile was adopted for June 19th of 2020. But as I go down the beach and I'm getting closer to Surf City, Then in your preliminary, if you're seeing any lines or anything in your preliminary, then that lets you know that this preliminary is, is what it, they are proposing for it to be, but it hasn't been adopted yet. So, for example, uh, if I'm looking at this property, the one next door to it here, you would have to go to your effective flood map in order to get information about this part of it. But where the shading is at, if you wanted to know about what it's going to be, what the flood part is going to be, you would want to look at flood preliminary and click on it. So it's going to be in an AE zone with a BFE of 12 feet, and it's on this panel number. Again, I got to get the dates fixed on it. But over on this side, if I was to click on this property, it tells you it's already effective. So that means you would need to go to the effective layer to get information about these properties because they were adopted. Does that make sense to everybody? Can I get a yes or a no? Are y'all with me? Okay, I got a yes. Okay, awesome. So, um, and then if you were wondering what the property was prior to it becoming, you know, effective for the new zone. So like if I, I was looking at this particular property here and I wanted to go to what it looked like prior to the change, then I can change my layer. And instead of looking at preliminary or effective, because preliminary is not going to show me anything because now it's effective by this new map, but I wanted to know what it was prior to that. 
then do your historic. So if I turn on my historic layer and I zoom out, so this is what it was prior to the new maps coming into effect. So now I need to go to my flood map historic. Couldn't see it for looking. And if I click on this particular property, then it tells me that, and it's giving me a number. That's not nice. It tells me that BFE is 13 and it's giving you the code instead of the, um, oh, there it is. Whew, scared me. There's your zone. So it's a VE zone. This entire area was a VE zone and it had a static elevation of 50, uh, 13. Remember, Oslo County has a two-foot freeboard, so your BFE would be 15 feet. So that bottom level of your floor would have to be at 15 foot above um, mean high water, which you would have to get a surveyor engineer to shoot um, out on the, because the ground itself might be higher. <clears throat> so now we're going to change it back from flood historic and we're going to turn it back on effective. We're going to change this back to effective. And now if we click on this property, <clears throat> now notice it's in an AE zone. It's not in a VE zone anymore. And the BFE now is 12 feet and it was 13. So for this particular property, the, um, the zone itself is not as um, intense as it was previously, and the elevation is not as high. <clears throat> but it could be the reverse of that. So that's why you want to look at to make sure as far as what it was and what it is. So on this side of it, where it has not changed yet, you would want to know what they're proposing. So that's why you'd want to look at the preliminary on that to be what they are proposing for that area. So that's why you'd want to turn on back to your preliminary. And sometimes you have to zoom in and zoom out to get it to take when you're changing. <clears throat> so they're proposing, <clears throat> sorry. Got a frog all of a sudden. So for this area, they're proposing <clears throat> still an AE zone, but all of these areas were in a VE zone and they're proposing for them to change. But you would still, if you were getting ready to sell this property, you would want to check this because this is going to have an effect on what their insurance rating is going to be. That makes sense to everybody? Everybody good with what I did? Hearing nothing, I'm going to move on. So if we go back to our parcel. Oh, another really cool thing that's in this. So let's turn off this flood. And I'm going to leave on our um, aerial here, our 2018 aerial. And the reason you see this area as being pink is because the pink is showing that it's in a municipality. If you wanted to turn that off so you wouldn't have to see, it wouldn't be, you know, blurred out, you can turn the city limits off. And then you'll be able to see through it. So in these in this area, um, this is a 2018 aerial. So what we can look at as well. So you, from our aerials, all of those are from the roof. So you all be able to see the roof of the property. So I wanted to really know more about this property, the way it really looked a little bit more. So we have. Um, what we call obliques. So you can use this little, if you hover over these tools, they'll tell you what they do. So this says um, oblique. So if I take that little tool and I click on top of my building, it's going to pop you up another window. And now I can look at it from different angles. Now, if you wanted to blow this up, and I always like to blow it up because I like to see more of it, then you can open it in a new window and it'll fill up your whole screen. So you can see this gives you the date on this. So notice that the date is 9-21-2018. So 
That was two weeks after Hurricane Florence because pictometry flew this for us because of the damages from the hurricane. So notice that what your streets look like, a lot of sand um, that came in. You can see as you, you can zoom in on them just like you can the other ones and you see the damages that took place on some of these properties. You see the shingles um, blown off here. <clears throat> and so what you can do is up here where you have the arrows, you can click to the next image, or you could also click here and it'll rotate your view. So you can go all the way around the property because it gives you different angles of that property. This is the part I don't like about doing this virtual because I can't hear anybody yelling and screaming because this should have been great, wonderful stuff to be able to see all of this because nowhere else can you see something that happened that close after the, the hurricane. So you can see all the debris that came up and you can see what was messed up with their property. And you can just keep spinning it around and looking at it and it'll go all the way around the property. Then, like I said, you can click here and you watch the date change. So you see now it says February 18th of 2018. So this is what the property looked like in February <clears throat> before the storm. Um, you can spin it. It's going to go back to um, September. Let me click back here again. So I'm back to my February and I'm, I'm looking at the properties in that area and you see what everything looked like. And then look at what it looked like after the hurricane. You can see a lot. You see that the, the water came right on up. Um, it, it took out some of their um, docks and stuff. It took shingles off, but it really filled the street with a lot of sand. And you can look and see how the water gushed around these properties. But you can see the ones that were damaged from the storm as well. And these are a little bit clearer images than what we have on our 2018s. And if you just wanted to look at a particular date, you can do this select drop down, and you could go down and you could pick the January through March of 2018 and spin it then. And it'll just show you the 20, the February ones um, to look at. And you can still spin around the buildings. Okay, so that's um, a different tool that's on there as well. All righty. Um, the other um, map layer as well, this is something <clears throat> that was new that was just added for this year um, with the new flood zone is, is the coastal A zone. So if you're in a coastal A zone and you're not in they didn't have it in a VE zone. Let me do a search because I can show you one that'll. Oh. oh my goodness, it's just go on. Has somebody got a question? Let's I need to change something. I can hear somebody somebody say something. Okay. Um, so on the coastal A zone, it changed some of the rules with the coastal A zone as far as what the flood part goes. So if your property fell in a coastal A zone, um, then you had different restrictions now that um, came about based on the coastal, um, the coastal A zone. Um, in other words, there were added restrictions if, you, if your property fell within this coastal A zone. So 
So <clears throat> if you're looking at the different flood parts of it and the different flood maps, it wouldn't tell you that part about the coastal A um, on, on most of the maps. I incorporated it in. So if I, again, turn on my map layers, and you can live on the coastal A zone, and if I turn on the flood effective, and I change my flood effective, um, I identify to the flood effective, and I click in the AE, so if I'm looking at my building, and I click on it, it tells me it's an AE zone with a 13 foot base flood elevation, but if I click out here in this part, then you can see that it's an AE zone, but it also tells you that it's in a coastal A zone as well. And that lets you know that you're going to have added restrictions for that particular property just because they are in a coastal A zone. So if I turned off my coastal A zone layer, then you can see I had it to dash it a different way um, to be able to tell. So it would jump out at you <clears throat> if it was in that coastal A zone just to let you know that there were different restrictions. So if you had a buyer, they may not have been in, there was no coastal A zone prior to June 19th of 2020. So they, you may have sold the house two years ago and now they come back to you to sell the house again. And if now they're in the coastal A zone, then there might be, um, different restrictions on it as far as the house. Like, for example, it, they may require extra vents or something under the, the bottom of it. I'm not sure what all those restrictions are. I just know that you need to be aware of if it's in a coastal A zone. And it all has to do with where this Lemoir layer is, which is your limit of wave action. So you notice that that Lemoir is right at the edge of where the coastal A zone goes. So from where the, um, the limits of your wave action is out to the water is um, considered um, a coastal A zone in the coastal areas of the county, unless it was a VE zone. If they had VE zones, then if, if this property out in this area was a VE zone, then your coastal A would have gone from that Lemoy line to the VE zone. So it either goes to a VE zone or to the water itself. So that's the differences in that. And like I said, it's just different restrictions that you need to be made aware of. So um, we're gonna look at some of the advanced searches that you can do with this as well. I'm gonna clear. If you've got lines showing up on there, that's because that's where we were identifying um, information. You can clear it by hitting that clear button. Um, if I wanted to go in and search properties, so for example, we'll, we'll look back at this, this property again. So maybe you've got a client and they're wanting to buy a property out in this area and you're wondering what things have sold for in this area. I can come across until I see my um, neighborhood code. So it says it's a neighborhood code of 4020. So I'm gonna go to my search and I'm gonna hit the advanced search and I'm gonna do that neighborhood code. You can either hit the drop down and pick it or you can type it in and then pick it. And so maybe I'm interested in anything that has sold in this particular neighborhood um, in the last year. So, and I want it to be a valid sale. I'm not interested in where husband and wife um, divorced and the wife got the property or whether a parent deeded property over to their child. I want a true arm's length transaction valid sale. So I'm gonna pick valid sale and then I'm gonna come down to deed date and I'm gonna go backwards to um, last um, August, I'm gonna pick August 1st, and then I'm gonna pick, I can pick today's date, it's not gonna matter. So I wanna find any properties that sold in this neighborhood that were valid sales in the last year. I don't know if it's gonna show me anything or not, but we'll try. Okay, so it gave me two results. So I got two properties that sold 
in that time frame that are showing that are valid sales. So those are the two properties that have sold in the last year with those valid sales. So uh, let's see if these properties are a different neighborhood because I know these properties sold. I want to see if they got a different neighborhood code. Because we were looking at the way the tax office had them, you know, linked together. Um, so this is a 4029 neighborhood. So let's try 4029. We're going to do the same thing, but we want to pick 4029 to see how many have sold in the last year. So four of these, and I will tell you this, this is a, a 2018 aerial, and we're looking that it was flown in February of 2018. So I can tell you that all of these now have homes on them and people living in all of those. So, but if you were wanting to see kind of what they sold for in that area and what they have sold in the last year, then as you're looking at the properties that it gave me, these four results, then here are your sale prices of what they sold for. And like I said, you can make this bigger. And you can click on the sale price and it'll put them from the lowest amount to the highest amount. Or if you wanted your highest one on top, you can click it again and it'll, it'll reverse that order of it. So maybe um, you wanted to mail these nice people a letter and you wanted to um, do like um, just envelopes for them, then you can um, go here to, because this has to do with what your results window is. So if you hover over these, it'll tell you what each thing is. So I can go here where it says create mailing labels and click on that. I can pick my Avery label type, 8160 is a, a pretty popular one. I can say submit, download labels, open those up. Use your patience. And ever how many you had in that um, results window, it's gonna format your labels for you to mail to those people. So you could, you know, put your labels in your printer and print that out with those labels on with the you know, so go ahead and put your addresses and stuff on for your labels for that. Okay, so now we can go back to our map. So another thing that you can do is maybe you want to do your own analysis or do something different with it. Maybe when you're mailing them a letter, you wanted to do a mail merge um, to be able to put their names on it. Or maybe you wanted something to know something else about this property and you wanted to work with it in Excel. You can just click on this Excel and you can save it to your, I normally tell people to save it to their desktop. We'll see if it's gonna let us open it. But you can save it to wherever you want on your property. I mean, on your desktop and you just gotta remember where you put it. That pin number, you need to stretch it. It's giving a funky number on it. Sometimes it does this when you open it um, online instead of saving it. So, but it's going to give you your owner's name, it's going to give you their physical address, and you can play with all the columns, but it gives you your, your field names and it gives you everything that we have on our records in there, the full gamut of everything that's in there. And then you can manipulate the data based on how, how well you can work with Excel. So, but if you did like a mail merge on it um, and you wanted to put their names in as the owner or whatever, then you could do that as well. So it gives you that Excel spreadsheet to work with. Then the other thing that um, is pretty cool that you can do with it is, so you might want to label on here what those properties are selling for. So you can click this label selected features. And then this little tool is gonna to come up and let's say I want to make them, I wanna put red, red or orange color. You can pick whatever color in here that you want it to be. Um, you can change your font to whatever different font you want it to be. I can make it bold. Um, you can do italics. Um, 
you can underline it, whatever. I can make it bigger. And then what field you want it to label. So I can go down here and say, I want it to label sale price. And it'll put your sale prices on whatever you have selected. Everybody see how I got that? So it only has to do with what you have in your results window. So, so here, this was my fourth one that sold. Um, so it's put the sale price on those based on what I picked here. I could have changed that. I could have put on um, the heated square footage of it. So if I want to see how big each one of the houses are, the square footage that's on there, I could label that. And then, of course, um, it, maybe you want to send that to your, um, your client. So I can go here to where it says print. And I can say um, recent sales. And you can do a letter um, portrait, or you can do it landscape or legal. And map only is going to fill the whole page up with just the map. This, the other ones is going to add a few little things to it. So we'll just do letter portrait, and I can say print. It's going to make it a PDF. You can change that PDF, and you can do a JPEG. Um, there's different formats that you can use with it. So then it's going to, whatever you typed in as the name that you wanted to put on it, it's going to put it at the top. Whatever you had on your screen is what it's going to put on there. And then it's going to put a date and a, um, a scale. And then because we're pulling something from the wetlands part of it, that's why it's throwing that on there to give them credit for it. That just happens to be a layer that's in our database. So if I'm like, hmm, I really didn't want that other extra stuff on there, then you can go back and maybe you want it to be a JPEG. So I can make it a JPEG. I'm going to tell my layout that I want it to be map only. So I want it to fill up my, my sheet with just the map, and I'm going to make it a JPEG. So I can say print. So then that's going to be my full sheet of paper with my JPEG image on it because it's based off of what your printing default is. So it's going to do like a... But I mean, I could take that JPEG and, and add it in to whatever else I wanted. Like if I've got a report or something and I wanted to put the JPEG in it, you can do that because there's your JPEG image. So that gives you a different way to get a difference off of your map versus where if you um, were looking at one property. So if I went to my results window again, and I come over to the left side and I did create report. That create report is only going to be like focused on one property. So if you were interested in getting multiple properties to show up, that would be the way to do that um, to get you a map to print to show, you know, more area than it zooming into your one, one property. Everybody good with that? Do I need to show you that again, how I got there? So I did my selection based on my search and my criteria for my advanced search. And it gave me this many results based on what I had. And then I went into and did my label here. So I can close this window. And I did my label. And I picked my field that I wanted it to label. So you could even put, you know, your book and pages on there, your plat book, your subdivision name, whatever. But I picked what, what I wanted it to label, which we put on there, um, the square footage of the house. But like I said, we could do the sale price, and it'll change it. And then I went to print. And with my print, like I said, you can call it, whatever you want to call it. And I can change it back to my PDF and I can do my print again and it's just going to do my map again. And 
and I can zoom way out so I can see my whole map. But you notice that it fills the whole page up if you pick map only. So if I go back and I change it, let's say I want to do, I think I'll do uh, legal landscape and I do print. Then your sheet of paper is going to be, uh, this map is going to be set up to do 11, um, uh, I mean, it's, what is illegal? Is eight and a half by 14. So then you could go file and print, and it's still going to print on whatever you have as your um, printer and what you've got your, your printer defaults on. So, and you can, but you could save this. So I can save this and save it on my computer. So maybe you'd want to send it as an email to your, you know, a potential um, client. Or I wanted to send it somewhere else. Now, I don't know why it left off my, it should have left on there what I had. And it was doing it, I thought. But it didn't put my, my labels on there. And it should have. Um, but wherever, whatever you have defaulted as your printer, that's where it's going to send it. So like right now, my default printer is telling me it's eight and a half by 11. So I would need to change my page setup to my legal size or it's not going to print correctly. So you got to make sure that you've got your printer set up to, to fit what your piece of paper is that you're trying to make it go to. Everybody good with that? Okay. Um, let's say you're looking at this and you're like, well, I really want to add a few more to my set. So you can click this little magic, I call it the magic wand. And I can say, well, I want to add this one too, because I really want to do something else with it. But I'm not interested. My client doesn't care about the properties over here on this side. So I can click it and that'll unselect it. So that little magic wand lets you add to, and it also lets you take away. So you just click on the wand. If you want to, if you've already got it selected and you click on it, it's going to go away. If you want to add it, you just click it. Um, this buffer all. So let's say I wanted to do a buffer around these three properties. I can click buffer all and it says buffer distance. So let's say um, you might have to do a um, notice for an area that you're trying to rezone. So I can say, I want to buffer this 100 feet, and it's going to buffer all three of those properties. And it says, would you like to select features from a layer that intersects the new buffer? You can say, no, just draw the buffer. So you just wanted to see what 100 feet around that was. It will just draw a buffer. But let's say I want to select parcels that are within 100 feet of this property. So I can say, create buffer. There's where your buffer is, and notice the properties that it selected. So now I got 12 results. So maybe you've got to notify everybody that's within 100 feet of your property um, that you are, you know, trying to do a rezone. So again, this is where you'd want to go to your Excel spreadsheet, download your Excel spreadsheet, so that you've got those owners' names that you have to notify. Again, you can do your labels and create mailing labels for all those 12 properties that's in there already formatted out. And I know our county planning, they require you to give them the labels and the envelopes um, already for them. They'll mail them out, but you have to give them the information and they'll want a list of all those. So again, your Excel spreadsheet, you can open that up and print it out and that's going to give you all of those owners to go along with it. So that's what your buffer tool does. Um, we talked about Excel, we talked about your mailing labels. This S, all that is is your cell code. Um, it just gives you, a, in, on one of our older versions, it just gave you a code and didn't give you what it meant. So I got a lot of requests for what is zero, zero, what is zero, one, but those are the different codes that when we are labeling properties, um, whether we say it's a valid sale or not. And that came from when we were doing our search. And we came here and we picked 
it used to just give you a number and it didn't give you the words out beside of it. So that's what that is and we've just never taken it off. And that's all that dollar sign is. Um, as far as different searches go, uh, another thing you can change all of this is totally up to you. Um, if you want to clear that and start all over, I can clear it and I can go back to the top. So let's say I've got a particular O and you got all of this on your screen and you wanted to get rid of it, just hit your clear and that clears everything that you put in there. So anything that you've added or whatever. Um, if I wanted to search by a subdivision name, so um, let's say I want to search for all the properties in Summer House. I can just type in subdivision name Summer House. You can't hit enter. You've got to scroll down and pick the bottom. And I say go. It's going to zoom me to all the properties in that are labeled Summer House. So, and you can see um, it says there's 930 results. Um, I was thinking there was more than that many on there. So another thing is it has a limit of how many it can search. So if I go back and I do my search, here's a way I can always tell you what the limit is. I'm gonna get rid of my summer house and I'm gonna say, I want to find all the properties in North Hopful Beach. And I say go. So that tells you that there's a limit of 1,000 because there's closer to 5,000 parcels in North Oxford Beach. Cannot explain why it picks the one, why it picked what 1,000 it picked because you see they're scattered all about. So we normally have that set to 2,000, but I have to call our contractor and tell him, hey, I need you to up those limits again. But if you truly needed, um, a spreadsheet or information about all the properties in North Hopsville Beach, then you could call us and we can export that information out and send it to you. So, because you can't do it on the website, it, it's, it's too many properties. So if, if you hit that 1000 results and, and you're trying, I always do North Hopsville Beach because I know they don't have an enormous amount of parcels, but they've got more than a thousand or two thousand, so I can see what my limits are for that. Um, but if you were doing this and it came up and it hits a thousand results, you need to tighten down your query. So if I was looking properties in North Topsail Beach and I wanted to see things that were valid sales and I wanted to see properties that have sold in the last, well, since we'll say since January 1st. then I can do that. So there's been 209 properties that have sold since then. And again, you can ex do the same thing, export that um, to be able to see all of them because you can see there's multiple windows that you would have to go through in order to get all those properties. So if I went over here and I did sale price, it's only gonna do sale price based on that first tab, not all 209 results. So that's why you might want to put them in an Excel spreadsheet and then you can manipulate the numbers to see which ones sold the highest and where they're located and that type of thing. So let's say um, I was in North Topsail Beach and, but I really only cared about properties that were on um, Island Drive. We'll see if anything sold on Island Drive. 29. There was 29 properties in North Topsail Beach that were on Island Drive that have sold since January that were valid sales. So it's, you know, you can look at all of these different scenarios of things that are in here um, to be able to see what kind of sales have taken place. Um, like I said, you can search by subdivision name, you can search by neighborhood code, um, if let's say on this, I'm only interested in properties that had a dwelling on it. So I can do my search then. I had 29 before, so let's see what I get now, 25. So 25 of those 29 have dwellings on them. 
I can do it based off of acreages. I can do it based off of heated square footage. You just have to fill in the columns, the from and the to, um, to be able to get your, you know, your limits of what you're searching. The other things that you can do, if I go to my select tool, so let's say I'm in an area and I wanted to just select an area of, of parcels, then I can, can do this one that's a line and then you just start drawing your map on your map, what you want to select and it's going to select wherever you drew that line. If I wanted a polygon of area, so maybe I want to start here and anything that your polygon touches, it's going to include. So that's a different way to, to select properties rather than using your query part of it or searching for an individual property. If you're just looking for things in an area and they're in different subdivision names and different neighborhoods, there's nothing basically alike on them other than the fact that that was an area that you were interested in. So, I mean, you can zoom out as far as you want to and you can select up to a thousand parcels. Um, you can do the same thing with the circle. You just draw a circle. So I'm interested in this area. It'll give you that. And again, you can download it, you know, into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, whatever you want to do with that information, you can, can manipulate it. Um, we talked about our searches. This search on this one is basically giving you the same thing that you do with your binoculars. The only thing is, is this may give you a wild card search, like if I, um, and, but it does give you PAR ID and North Carolina PIN, and the PIN number is this number here, but let me just give you a warning about that. I know a lot of y'all, and it's, a base, it's based a lot of times on what people do across the state, or maybe across the United States, um, a lot of people want to use that PIN number. That PIN number is, is based on a true X and Y location. That's what is generating the PIN. But because we know that we are not tied to that number and neither is our tax office tied to it because the tax office uses the PAR ID number, we use this alt ID or map number because that's where our filing cabinets are set up because that's the number that we used to use in the older tax system we had. But this PIN number, because it is generated off of a true X and Y location, let's say I had to shift all these parcels because um, I got a call or something and they're like, hey, these look like they're off. Let's say the road and all that was sitting over here and all of our property lines went through the building, then I would know our mapping is way off and we would need to remap. Well, that PIN number is generated from the center of that parcel. So if I had to shift that parcel over this way, then all of these parcels, PIN number is going to change. If I have a 10 acre track and I split it up into two, um, or I split one acre off of it, off of my 10 acres, my nine acres that's left is still going to have the same PAR ID number it's still going to have the same alt ID or map number, but that PIN number is going to change for that remaining nine acres because the center of the parcel has now shifted. So just be aware of that if you're trying to write contracts and stuff like that with the PIN number, it could be almost impossible to find that PIN if we've done anything with our mapping at all because that number is going to change. So just be aware of that. So, but if you did, somebody did happen to give you that PIN, um, then you could use this search and put that, you know, a PIN number in here. And if we had that PIN still the same, it would go to it. Your tools, these give you some drawing tools. So, let's get rid of this. For example, let's say I want to know what the distance is from this structure out to the ocean. So I'm going to use my distance tool and I want to know how many feet it is. So I'm going to change it to feet. You got to, in order to activate the tool, you click on distance. And so I'm going to start at the driveway and I'm going to click and I'm going to come out here to the sand and click. 
so it's 313.6 feet from that driveway out to getting on the sand of the beach. So maybe I am interested in buying half of this property. So I'm gonna clear what I had. Now, instead of distance, I'm looking for area. So I wanna know how much acreage half of this property would be. To activate the tool, you click area, and then you start drawing. So I go, I click my first corner, I go around the property, and then I double click at the end. So it puts your measurements, how much measurement it is from point to point to point, but it also gives you what the area is. So it's 0.07, and I can tell it to label that on the map. It gets really busy um, when it's that small of an area. But if you were working in a, a bigger tract of land and wanted to know that kind of information, um, maybe somebody's looking at a piece of property and they want to know how much cleared land or woodland there is, then um, that would be a good tool to use. Let's see if I can get to an area that will give me that. I need to get off the beach. So maybe I'm looking at this property and they're like, okay, I want to know how much of that property is cleared. So I click my area tool and I can just click around. Oops. I need to deactivate it because it didn't deactivate. So you got to hit deactivate on it. Otherwise, it's going to come from the other part and clear it. Deactivate. So now I want to go back to my area. And I'm going to activate my tool again. So it tells me it's 0.73 of an acre for this particular area that I'm in. <clears throat> so, oh, those other one lines that were going around it is because when I was doing it previously, I still had my distance tool activated. So it was giving me that as I kept going. So um, same thing here, if I clear it um, and I go back to my distance tool and I click on my distance and I wanted to know how far it is across. It'll tell me there, if I keep going, it's going to keep giving me the measurements as I'm going. So that's how you would be able to get, you know, so it's 198.54 feet from this point to that one, 118.95 from here to there, 203 to there, and then it's kind of hard to see, but it looks like 118.16 back to the beginning. And then it gives you all of that and it gives you your total feet as you go all the way around it. But when you're using that tool, you got to make sure you deactivate it because if you were to even close this window out, that tool will still be active. And anything you try to click on, it's going to keep trying to activate that. And then you can clear it. The other things that you can use on this, you can use markups on it. Um, so like if you wanted to pinpoint a property for somebody, um, you can click this dot and you can change the color of it. Um, you can change whether it's a circle or a diamond or a square. So maybe I'm going to make them a diamond and then I can click on my property and it's going to put diamonds on whatever properties I was interested in. Or if I wanted to put a cross on it and I'll make it green, then it's going to change it to that. Same thing, you got to deactivate it to get it to stop doing it. Clear your graphics. Um, I can draw a line on it, change it, do the color of the line if I just want a straight line. I got You hold your mouse down and drag it, and it'll put your line on there. Um, if I wanted to have free range of drawing, I can do that. If I wanted it to not be so free, I can do this one. Oops, come on, tool.
So again, you want to deactivate it. Otherwise, the next thing you do will keep going. You want to clear it. You can leave them on there if you wanted to print that. And same thing with shapes. If I wanted to um, add different shapes on there and I wanted them to be solid filled or I could um, diagonally cross it. So let's say I put a, a box on here. So that way I can get them to, you know, show them a certain area that I'm interested in. And if you didn't want the, it to have a field color or whatever, or you want to change it, you can change it. It'll let you change different ones as you're doing them. Um, well, there you go. So there's your field colors. Um, if I wanted to make it, whatever different changes you wanted to make with it, it'll let you do that. And then if I wanted to write something on it, And because I've got my other tools still active, then that's why it's putting a circle around it with that on it. Because I still have this tool, I didn't deactivate this tool. So if I deactivate this tool and then go to my text and say add text, it's just gonna add the text. So that's why I'm telling you about the deactivate. If you don't deactivate a tool, it'll keep right on going and going and going. So make sure you deactivate it before you go to the next thing. So I'm gonna deactivate that clear my text, and if you just want to get rid of everything without having to clear each thing, you can go here and clear it. No, no you can't. You're going to have to clear it here to get rid of those. There is a delete button up there somewhere that will let you get rid of, oh, here it is. That would have let you done it. That would clear everything, including the text and stuff. This just clears stuff that you've selected. Okay. You can create bookmarks that will just be on the computer that you're on. So let's say this was properties of interest to me. I can do a bookmark on it. Um, I can add my own bookmarks. There's some bookmarks already there. So if I've created a bookmark, so like if I wanted to go to Jacksonville City, it'll zoom me out to the city limits of Jacksonville. If I want to go to Richland City Limits, those are bookmarks that are already there. But let's say, uh, again, I was at North Hopsville Beach and I was on a particular property and I wanted to bookmark that. I can say, add a bookmark and I can call it um, sales at North Hopsville. Okay, so that bookmark is going to be there. So now if I've gone to Jacksonville and I'm looking around properties or I just go anywhere else, um, let's say I go back to the Banks Bridge stuff. So I'm here and then I'm waiting for that, you know, a person who's interested in a sale calls me and I have that bookmark, but you've got to go to that same computer it'll take you back to what you bookmark. So that's a way to add your bookmarks in. Um, this extract tools will let you extract layers. So like if I wanted to um, pull all of the parcels in um, this, just this area, I can say, extract the parcels and I can go down and it's going to extract it as a shape file, which is our, our format of the way we do stuff with our GIS. Um, but let's say maybe um, you've got a surveyor that is interested, you want to give him some lines that we have, then this Autodesk AutoCAD Generally, the DXF or the DWG is generally um, files that they can read. Most CAD systems can read those. And you could um, 
could export it or extract it in that format and save that file on your desktop to use, you know, to give to, to that person. Or if you've got a, a CAD product that you use, it will let you add that in. Um, this data download, <clears throat> we download, um, we create shape files again um, because other places like to add our, our information in. Um, if you have somebody that can read a shape file, like I said, they got a CAD system or whatever, or um, another county or DOT or whatever, they, this is the entire county, guys. They can download these files. Um, and we update our address points, our center lines, um, and our parcels every night. So this date is when they were last updated. Your results window, most of these tools are um, toggles. So they will toggle it on or off. So if I can't see the little black X in the corner, I can click up here and that'll turn it on or turn it off. Um, you can share through email, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. It's going to just share what's on your screen. You can, um, we have some links to uh, wetlands. So if you really wanted to know about wetlands on a particular piece of property, then you could click this wetlands and it's going to go in here to the National Wetlands Inventory. It's going to give you all the information about their wetlands for particular properties. You can go to this wetlands mapping and look at different layers and information on that. Um, if you're looking at the data and you click wetlands mapper, I think it'll take you to the map itself. Yeah. So then you can go here. It lets you zoom to it and it gives you, it's very um, good at giving you the details on how to make all of this work. But you could zoom into your property that you're interested in in the county and get the most up to date wetlands based off of what the National Wetlands Inventory is. So that's a link that we have on there. We also have a link to um, COBRA, which is also CBRA, but that's your um, coastal barrier resource areas. And of course, on North Tulsa Beach, they're the ones that have the COBRA zones. Um, and those are those areas that I think are excluded from like FEMA, like if there was um, a hurricane and a declaration was done and there was FEMA funding, then I think if you're in a COBRA zone, you're excluded from that. Um, I know you're excluded from the like the um, flood part of it. I think it's really hard to get insurance in areas that are COBRA zones. So you might, it just gives you more information about it though. You can go to that. Well, no, you can't. We need to fix that link. So there's something wrong with the link. We need to fix that. But it'll give you more information about it. I'll fix. I'll make a note to fix that link. Um, there is a help screen that gives you information about how to navigate um, our web. You know, just the website itself. Uh, Rock is the vendor that is. Um, it's there. They wrote the application um, that we use. And so sometimes when things don't work like we want them to, then um, like that link, I need to call them to get them to fix that link. Um, then they are, they are the ones that we contact for that. Uh, this little um, key or tool gear, whatever, that if you wanted, again, more real estate space, you didn't want to see that up there, you can just click that. It turns that on or off. Um, the little Google man, so if I wanted to look at a, the street view, you can click out in the street and this goes to Google Maps and you can, um, you know, go down the street. Um, you can spin it around to see what's on the other side of the street. And you can see this is the, the, like a reflection of it, but a car actually drives around all the roads and it has on top of the car a camera and that's how they get all the Google stuff. 
But it, we use this sometimes just because, like, if we're not sure what an address is, then sometimes you can zoom in close enough and you can read what the address is on it, like if we didn't have a true address. So that helps sometimes. And then sometimes you can spin it and look at the house itself and read the house numbers on it sometimes. So that helps. Um, we talked about the binoculars. This is going to take you all the way back out to the full extent of the map. If you accidentally hit that and you're like, oh, I didn't want to do that. I want to go back to where I was. Then you can hit these arrows and it'll take you right back to where you were. So you don't have to worry about that part of it. If you wanted to zoom to the next place that you were, which is where I was zoomed all the way out, it would take you all the way out. Um, these icons, of course, like your zoom in, you can click that and drag a, a box on your map and it'll zoom in. Or same thing, you can zoom out doing the same thing. Um, this is like what used to be a hand on our old site, but you just, you hold your mouse down and, and you can drag the mouse, uh, drag your property, the, the map up or down or wherever. Um, this is, if you were not sure, like if you're in an area and you're like, hmm, I, there's no addresses on that at all and you kind of wanted to geolocate where that's at, you can click on the map. You can click on the map with that geolocate tool. Oh, no. It's going to let you geolocate to exactly where you're at driving. So like if you were driving out and you had this up on your, um, your phone and you wanted to see where you were at in relation to our map, that geolocate will do that. And then if you're kind of curious where you're at from there, um, you might can zoom back out and or just zoom out from where you click. But I mean, it definitely is working because it's taking me right back to, our, to my office. But um, sometimes you can zoom out and be able to tell where you were at before. But if you could put a bookmark in there, then you could tell that. We talked about our obliques, and this is, like I said, clears anything. Like if you put text or whatever on this map, then it will clear that off. And always remember that this identify tool goes with what this layer is. So whatever layer that you pick, if you've got something different on, like if I had the zoning layer, as my identify, but notice I don't have my zoning layer turned on, and I click that identify tool and I just clicked on the map, it's gonna give me the zoning for that. So then I might not know exactly which one I'm at, but so that area there is zoned as a B1, but it's North Hopeful Beaches zoning. So anytime you see a hyperlink, you can click on that hyperlink and it should take you to another document. But notice when I clicked on it, it says, summary of Oslo County Zoning Ordinance. So that's not North Topsail Beaches. And they used to have in, in their county zoning um, ordinance, they did have a link in for the municipalities that would take you to the municipalities data. But because it take you to their website, you can go to from that document. But we have it on there um, to link to our Oslo County stuff, because generally the data that we're looking at is for our county. But if it says Oslo County there under that data field, that's what jurisdiction it's in. So then you could click that and it would tell you, like if you didn't know what B1 for Oslo County meant, if you click that, it'll tell you under here what B1, you know, you'd have to keep scrolling down to see. But the municipalities zoning codes it, they might have an R10, but their R10 could mean something completely different than what Onslow counties means. So you would need to find out from that municipality what their zoning means for B1 or R10 or whatever. But it just gives you a hyperlink to go along with it. But I always tell people, don't just identify um, with it because most of the time people are zoomed way in 
And so let's say this was a big tract of property and the first 50 feet of the property was commercial, but the back part, part of the property wasn't commercial. And you wouldn't know that if you were zoomed in really close. And you might tell somebody, oh yeah, you can build a business on that. Well, they might want to build their business on the, on the back part of their, you know, more than 50 feet off of the road and it wouldn't be zoned for that. So that's why I always tell people, whatever layer you want to identify, make sure you have that layer turned on because you don't want to um, tell somebody the wrong, the wrong thing because you didn't have the, that layer actually turned on. And when we make a change to these layers, um, some of them, like I said, are automatically updated each night, but some of them are not, like our zoning layer, we send that, the city limits and all that, we send that on to um, our vendor so that he can um, add it to the website. So our website, we try to keep as up to date as possible. Um, so you can turn the layer on though, and then it will give you what the zone is as well. So like this says R10, that says B1. So as you zoom out, you can see the different colors. And then if you want to know a little bit more about it, like Con D, if you want to know what that meant, then you would know that's North Hopsville Beaches and you'd have to go to their website or give them a call to let them know, um, to ask them what CON D stands for. Um, so just remember, like I said, that tool goes with that and this active layer, this is what they're considering the active layer. So like right now, if I try to search 140 Banks Ridge Road in zoning and I say go, it's gonna tell you there's nothing there because there's not a 140 Banks Ridge in the zoning layer. But now if I wanted to go in and search for R-10, it's gonna find everything that's got R-10s in it throughout the county. So whether it's North Tulsa Beach, whether it's the county, Swansboro, whatever. So you can see that um, um, a lot of the municipalities also have R-10s as well as the county. So, so just remember this goes with that. Um, this is a um, select by extent. So same thing, it's another way to select. So if I went in and I, I could draw a box around the area to select. But right now it's just gonna select the zoning because that's what I have turned on. So if I wanted to select the parcels, I have to change it back to parcels. And then I can go in and do a selection. It's gonna select my parcel and give me information about my parcel, not the zoning. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Is there something that you wanted to see that I did not show you? Or any question about anything with the data? Um, that you always wanted to know but were afraid to ask? Um, or is there something I didn't show you? No questions? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Okay. Um, so, uh, if nobody has any questions for me, um, then I would be finishing up this meeting unless there's something somebody wants me to show you. Okay, well, I appreciate you, Ms. Patricia, and being so flexible with us back and forth between dates and uh, locations. Um, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate um, you giving me the opportunity to um, show you how to use our site a little bit better. They always love it. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.